you very much. That wonderful uh, presentations. I think there are many, many very interesting points made here. Uh, we will open it up for, for discussion, and, but I would like to start off uh, with a question of my own, a burning question. Um, <clears throat> Cindy spoke about uh, uncertainty, and uh, all of these uh, organizations here uh, managed to, well, some started very, very small with a half a million dollars or $150,000. I think it was a scenario with phase one SBIR and, and, and KDP as well. Um, if you looked at Ellis's uh, 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 slide deck, there was a half a million dollars all the way at the bottom. It's very easy to look at the $118 million BARD application, but then again, starting small uh, apparently does a trick, and, and he did, did speak about that. But what I would like to, to talk about initially is, is the uncertainty factor. How does an organization, how does management deal with uncertainty uh, in terms of uh, allocating internal resources, uh, multiple submissions, Expectations from uh, from employees and, and so on. Whoever wants to to uh, comment, I'll direct it to Cindy. <laughs> so we, as as you saw from one of the slides I, sh I showed, we've had quite a volatility of um, incoming funds over the years, and and it is very difficult to manage to. And sometimes you apply for grants or applications and you don't have the people on staff and then if you do get the approval then you need to, to quickly assimilate those resources. Um, likewise, we've, we've had to do some restructurings and downsize and, and so those are not pleasant um, activities either. We're a bit blessed in that we have other programs that we can source funding for through public markets or through pharma partners and, and so we can balance that a little bit more. But even so, it's a challenge. I'm curious to hear uh, Stephen's follow-up after all uh, Stephen does, or, or, or mention that all of their funding uh, did come from non <coughs> sources, uh, no dilution there, um, and have to your thoughts. So how do we deal with it? I got a lot of headaches. <laughs> um, with the exception of a three-year period where we had a um, major Gates Foundation grant, we've never had any you know time where you know it was clear that you were going to have you know enough money and sometimes it's two months and sometimes it's a year and sometimes it's 14 months and it's a continuous process so you're continuously building you know applications on top of applications talking to different groups um, dealing you know sometimes you hire sometimes you you know it, it's 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 a balancing act I don't think so dissimilar to uh, you know, a biotech company that's getting all of its money from VCs and living with, in some cases, the headaches, you know, uh, of that. It's not for the faint of heart in any way, shape, or form, and, uh, but you need to have many, many different strategies, and as you can see, many different potential sources, because you just never know when you get that review panel that comes in and somebody didn't like you on there, and you're just, you got the best application you've ever made, and it's not even reviewed, which happens also. So, so where, where would you rate in the corporate uh, ladder the importance of non dilutive funding? And, and of course, uh, those of you uh, that have secured uh, many, but also probably could, could look at or, or look at your uh, fellow industry uh, partners, where would you suggest that they rate uh, their uh, non dilutive funding efforts? Uh, internally, I think, uh, Will, I'd like to hear your take on that, because after all, you guys raise both VC money as well as, as non dilutive funding. Sure. Um, well, in the, in the case of Novodime, we rate it incredibly high, not just because I'm the director of government affairs. Um, but uh, at the time, uh, you know, when you, you, you look at the, the timing of the company, uh, the kind of the landscape for dilutive funding, um, it, it wasn't on the top five list of what VCs wanted to invest in vaccine infectious disease, 2008-2009, uh, um, weren't stellar years, and, and VC today still is the same. It, it's, I mean, they, they uh, um, so the, uh, I think any, anybody who's interested in uh, any, any amount of dilutive funding should have a non-dilutive uh, a strategy and in that strategy you should also have um, in your dilutive strategy uh, you know it should should take into 
consideration what you can do uh, with the dilutive funds to offset uh, or extend your runway. Um, so I, I, I hope I answered that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Any questions, by the way? Uh, yes, please. So, so you, you know, I, I've been in venture back companies and I've been with the bank pretty well. The, the flip side to all these grants is that you're locked into a project, the money's allocated, and if something goes wrong yeah. or if there's another opportunity, there's a huge opportunity cost if you're suffering from this, you've got to spend the money to pursue the project. So, I, yeah. Yeah, and I, I would I would even add to that the the army uh, program that we had uh, we put in probably two three million of the domain money into that army program, uh, you know to, to support that, um, and so there's added risk on down the line. Fortunately for us, the uh, the vaccine that we had much of the work also applied on the Canada side, so we had two two. To markets as well. So you could apply some of those clinical ideas and pick up the Potentially, yeah, yeah. And uh, the uh, uh, and it, it provided a backup strategy. So we had the staff side as a backup, and we still do. We still have the phase, the good, tremendous data on the phase one staff. Uh, almost equally, if not better, data on the on the Canada side. So the staff side was fully supported by by Army. Uh, and I, I, but, but what you say is, is exactly right. Uh, you run the risk of you know, getting to some point and you've, you've, you've put you know, all your resources towards this and there are indirect costs that are not, you know, and you've heard all the panelists talk about that, you know, that, 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 we, that we tally up. And so it's a double-edged sword, the, the non-dilutive funding. So. I want to add something to that as well, um, and it's something that we've heard a number of times with the uh, because of our BARTA contract, is people, investors will say, well, yeah, but you've got this, you're stuck with it, and um, gee, the government could just change their mind any minute, right? On the other hand, if I did a deal with Bristol-Myers or Pfizer, they can change their mind any minute, except they're getting 80% of the economics of the drug, and BARTA is getting nothing other than the product that they're, built, that they're paying to develop. So a lot of times, you know, part of that, yes, you're stuck in that, but if I had a partnership with Pfizer, I'd be stuck in that as well. So I think it's how you frame the way you look at it as to what the benefit is. Um, because we do have people saying, well, when are you going to partner your drug? Well, why would I partner it? When <clears throat> I'm getting all the work done and it is completely non-dilutive, and people seem to think of partnerships, and I know there are different types of partnerships, and I think you were talking about one that, was, that certainly was non-dilutive, but most of the drug partnerships are extremely dilutive. They're just back-end dilutive. So, that is just my thought. I, I think that <clears throat> the question really goes to knowing what your strategy is. I mean, you're not, you're not pursuing non-dilutive financing for the sake of pursuing non-dilutive financing. And if you're doing that, then you're probably going to find yourself in exactly the box that you described. Uh, so you have to have an objective and a strategy and pursue those things that you can see are going to accrue value to you whether that project <coughs> succeeds or not. And, um, you know, in our case, we've been very fortunate to be able to do some of those things. And we're seeing, you know, we're seeing some of that dynamic change in that in that we we set out initially and we were pursuing non-dilutive financing because we had a lot of questions we wanted to answer and we could in any of those uh financing sources would allow us to answer some of those questions I mean, as time has gone on we've answered more and more of the questions so we're getting more and more selective about the kinds of things that we pursue so i, I really think it goes back to what's your strategy and making sure that what you're going after mm -hmm. is going to accrue value to you regardless of what the narrow objectives of that particular grant award may be. Yeah, if I could just add to that, I, and I think each one of us made, made the point, particularly when you're developing a platform or trying to improve processes or efficiencies, uh, this type of funding really is very nice to have, and, and I would agree with, with your remarks. I, I think there are you have to be strategic about how you, you go after the funding, how you want to use it, and then it's a balance of, of what other funding opportunities you might have. Any more <clears throat> questions out there? 
So I actually uh, have a question. Uh, following up at the end of, of Will's presentation regarding uh, uh, making connections with program officers and relationships, uh, I'd like to actually ask Hugh, Hugh about this. Uh, and it once again brings me to the beginning of, of my remarks regarding uh, starting small. So how important are those relationships that you established with uh, program officers? And uh, would you agree that after all, the science is what really gets awarded and not being best buddies with the PO. I, I think that they are equally important. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think that you, you can't certainly, you have to have good science, you have to have good programs, you have to have, uh, you know, appropriate and, and uh, well thought out milestones and you have to meet those milestones. But, I, but, in, but in this way, I don't think it's any different than business development at large, is that you're dealing with the program manager or you're dealing with somebody who's in charge of your, your project, and they're a person, and they have requirements, they have needs, they have pressures on themselves to the extent that you can understand those things and you can deliver the goods for them uh, not only are you going to make your life a lot easier within the context of that particular project, uh, as I said before, the, the projects will find you, and that, that's certainly been our experience where you, 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 you make a program manager look good and they, they not only come back to you, they talk to their friends and they're, all of a sudden you're getting phone calls from uh, their colleagues and other agencies, and I could cite a couple of those cases where one program manager at the Department of Defense talked to his friend who was at the Department of Homeland Security and they called us up and asked us to submit. And, and, and those things happen and I think it's, it, it, again, it's not any different than business development or sales in any other venue is you, you have a customer, you take good care of your customer and they'll come back and see you. I think that's an excellent point, Hugh. And the, the, you know, the other thing that um, I think one of the lessons we learned too is to listen to the people that you're dealing with. So in biodefense, in particular with BARDA, there have been a lot of very high profile disappointments. And what happens is what you hear in the investment committee, community is, gee, BARDA can't be, you can't work with them. Well, when you dig under it, what you find out is that if you listen to BARDA, they've got very good scientific people and, and they do want to follow the science and they want to make good decisions. And many times a company will approach BARDA with their own agenda and say, well, this is what we have, so we want you to do it this way. And BARDA will look at it and say, no, well, we need to do this, or you're not doing this, you know, we need to check this out, and they'll fight it. And when you fight it, just like with anybody, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna develop you know, personal issues, but you're also, you're not following the science. And so what happens in those situations is the company doesn't end up getting what it wanted right and ends up getting disappointed and then they go out on the conference circuit and they blame the other side when actually when you look under the hood it was the company not listening to what it was that that agency was looking for in the first place and so it becomes a challenge and anyway that's my thought. excellent point absolutely and, that, and that's really uh on a personal note we, we do try to do that as well uh and ron once again did touch upon that in the presentation N not to say that we promote your work or say, hey, here's a great company that you should fund, but it's about understanding what are the interests of the funding agency, what are they looking to fund it, and once again, all the panelists here describe exactly that. Um, is, there, is that a question? I want to question that. Okay. And uh, yeah, so, so what are they looking to fund? And try to <coughs> mold your project to meet their requirements. But once again, we do not want you to make a hard left turn just because that's, that's what they want to do. And maybe Russell was uh, uh, touching upon that uh, slightly. If it's not within your corporate strategy, maybe you shouldn't be going for it. It has all these have to, uh, these, the corporate strategy and your non delivered funding strategy should be aligned. And that's what we also try to do uh, internally. Yes? So I want to take a slightly different question here in terms of uh, rights. So I know that by and large, you know, non delivered is a very attractive obviously. And so in many cases, it can be the only route to get one. So they have a choice. But having said that, though, uh, I'd be curious to know your comments about what kind of other kinds of rights do you provide from an IP perspective and whether or not you're straight in the game down the road, you may have an come back to write you and you can expand into the next one day and all that sort of thing. Do you buy a lot of IP? Yes. So, um, 
when you get an NIH grant, you're committed to actually publishing your results or patenting your results. You can't really keep trade secrets. Um, but you own those results. The government can go into your company, it doesn't matter what company you have for anything, and say that it's a national emergency <laughs> and we need your product. But so you don't really give up anything when you get at least NIH grants at all. If you go to a foundation, which may have some kind of global, like Gates Foundation has global access requirements and so on, you have to commit in general that you're going to develop, you know, that vaccine for children in Africa. And if you vary from that, then they get to take your IP. But as long as you stick to that, you're generally okay. That, that's been kind of my experience. I want to add, too, is with BARDA, you're not giving up the IP piece of it or any economics, but you do give up a certain amount of control of the process. So, um, because it is a collaborative effort and, you know, there, there needs to be approvals and, and so you, you do give up a little control of the timing of what you're doing. So, so if I may ask you another question related to your presentation, you talk about leftover money from going under what you can come with, trace it back to how you deliver it. I think in general there's a skepticism with government agencies about the idea of perhaps satisfying and putting a budget together. Um, so to that extent, is there, are there any policy rules that say that if you have any money that's left over, you just go back to them rather than rescoping your project, and, or, or is it something that is uh, in general they don't worry about? With our contract, that wasn't the case. But what, what our contract was set up at the time it was ish, it was uh, we entered into the contract. It was um, during a period of uh, continuing resolution. So there are certain rules the government can't enter certain contracts. So our contract was built essentially with a one-year base period contract with a bunch of options. And so what we did was is as we were able to save money as we began developing, and these were things we couldn't necessarily predict going into it, and as we were able to save money, we brought deliverables from the options that would have been done later. So uh, there wasn't a rule associated with it, but it was, well, let's, rather than just not do the work, we're, we're going to do the work anyway, but let's just move it forward and get it started. Yes? You know, I noticed a couple of the companies, regional proximity is close to Washington, D.C. Does that <laughs> help with being present in that area and, or making frequent trips to, to Washington and being face-to-face -face help with this process? Um. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Um, well, you know, we have multiple, because of much of the infrastructure of the country that can do research and development for malaria at the highest level is in the D.C. metro or Baltimore area. So that's, you want to get reagents, you want to get parasites, you want to pass things around, um, then this is a good place to be. Uh, in, in regard to applying for at least, say, SBIRs, which has been our, our major source of funding. Not really. On the other hand, we've got such a large portfolio now that we're, they're actually having reviews. So it depends on what kind of funding mechanism. If you want to try to get a clinical trial through a vaccine testing unit of the NIAID, then it's nice to be able to go over and meet with them about it. Um, if you're going for these large competitive grants, um, I don't really think it matters that much, to tell you the truth. I, I would, you know. Yeah, I, I would just echo that. And I think it is very much product specific, technology specific. If you're in the vaccine space, and, and we also work on malaria, it, it is very uh, convenient to be there. And it, and it also goes back to the remarks about people and relationships, and you establish those long relationships with people, and you continue to collaborate. And, and we've had a, a very successful uh, track record of doing that. So it absolutely does help for us to be in, in that location. Yeah, all those things are, are true and very consistent with the experience that we've had. The one thing that I would say kind of in, in, in response to one of Will's comments is that we, we have a completely different strategy relative to our congressional delegation. Stay away from them. You know, um, and, and that, that part of that's political commentary, but part of it is we don't use our congressional delegation in any way, shape, or form to interact with the, with the agency partners that we have. 
that's a that's a deliberate decision. We've you know, and, and I I won't I won't say right or wrong, but in our case, we found it probably counterproductive, uh, and we wanted to let our projects and our capability stand on their own, either they're good enough or they're not. Agreed. We did the same thing. So, okay. Yes. So first, I want to thank yeah. Fremont for facilitating this activity. I come almost every year. They're always fabulous. Found especially. Very good point. <laughs> yeah. I every year, every year, every year. This is your first time. And each year I get new to this stuff. As I get better and better, my brand, as my companies move forward along, like, I don't, I'm not affiliated with them, so this is no commercial. I don't even know his name. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this, this is fabulous. This panel discussion you've given me some really salient advice for moving forward. So first, I just want to thank you for that. Um, so I'm working with a number of I'm working with an incubator, a number of different startup companies right now. Some have a lot of funding, some have just NIH funding, so we're at different stages. There's one thing that is not typically addressed here, and my, my accountants asked me to ask this, so let me say it specifically. Um, a lot of government grants and agencies working with government grants need help in setting up the books to meet government accounting requirements. Uh, our company, one of them took us six months to get the books in place. Uh, others took about three to five months, others, just others collapsed because they couldn't work through this process. So we know how to do this, and we've gotten really good at this. We've got our templates that we set up with our other companies. I was wondering if, if your group, the free mind, or any of the panelists have any advice or contacts for that to help our companies and also for the people that are sitting here that maybe they're new to it. It is borderline a nightmare situation. And I, don't be discouraged. You can do it. You've got to get people. Anybody care to comment uh, regarding the books? Uh, our, our company wrestled with that. We still wrestle with it. Um, I, mean, I, I agree, it's a it's a big issue. But honestly, after after kind of resisting it initially, I, the more I looked at it, the more I thought we need to do this anyway. And th you know, this is it, it's it's. A pain, but it's good practice. It's good business practice. So um, I, I, I just would echo. I mean, we found a way to do it. We wound up uh, uh, utilizing an accounting firm. We're 700 miles away from Washington. We wound up hiring an accounting firm in Washington uh, who who does this kind of thing, and they've came in and helped us set up our books. And now we have a you know we have internal resources that do it. And an outside kind of consulting relationship that we that we call on from time to time to help us with things. And as I said, it's been a good it's been a good business practice for other things now that it's done. And I think as part of the BARDA contract, we're required to use EVMS or Earned Value Management System. And um, what we found going through, and, and, and that's part of where we saved a lot of money because we had a lot of money budgeted in the original budget to set that system up. And we heard all kinds of nightmares, and you need to go buy software that costs half a million dollars to do it. Um, ultimately, we found out it pretty much mirrors Gap. And it, at being a public company, we were doing most of this anyway. And so we just have to, there's, you've got the forms you need to put together and the, EVN, the uh, work breakdown schedule, and it basically calls a contract. And yes, it's a bit of a pain in the neck, but it's not as bad as you know, it is. So uh, we, again, we saved a lot of money because we had budgeted a ton of money with consultants to help us with that. Mm -hmm. And basically, my controller and I put it all together. And so it wasn't that bad. It's kind of related to that, and I'll just touch on it because it's kind of a, it, it, it's a challenge. At least I found it a huge challenge. Not, just, not the accounting, the language. You know, if you don't speak acronym, it's hard to do business with the government. And... And it, and there is a, you know, there is a period of time that you kind of have to go through to understand what is EVMS. Yep. You'll be talking to the program, and they'll throw it out and, and expect they think everybody in the room knows what it is, and yep. and and that's just one example. It's it's a it, that is a big challenge to overcome. Don't so, the acronyms. Yeah. so we only have uh, about a couple minutes left, and I would like to conclude uh, with with one question. I really an attempt to put our panelists on the spot. If each one of you could give us one slice piece of your penultimate advice for the uh, 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 folks sitting here. What would it be? Hugh. I, I think it was, it's a comment we've already made is uh, understand what your strategy is and make sure that 
the programs or the financing that you are pursuing is aligned with your strategy and you know what you're getting into before you get into it. Russell? I was going to steal that one too. Um, but I would say the other thing is just make sure that your estimate of time required for from beginning to end, and even while you're executing, that you're not too overly ambitious in terms of your time expectations. Meaning, it's going to take a little longer than you think. But, that, but as long as you plan it accordingly, you'll be okay. I have to echo the strategy uh, piece. I, I, I can't underscore that enough. I think you have to really think about what it is you want, what rights you want, what ownership. Uh, we've, I think, over the years, sometimes taken money just to take the money and weren't as strategic, and then you look back and say, gee, I wish I would have done whatever. Uh, so I, I think it's being strategic. Yeah, I would, uh, I would just suggest that um, when you look at the, uh, the, the non-dilutive program or approach that you're going to take, just make sure that you have, you have a backup strategy. Um, I know uh, uh, whether it's another program or investment, if you're on a critical path, if you're not just living on non-dilutive funding, if you have a timeline, I would highly suggest you look at either a portfolio of different programs or even investment. So since I'm last, I'll get two answers. All right? Okay. All right? Is that all right? So the first one is I agree. Mission is everything. That's why I put the mission up first. And you have to keep your eye on the prize continuously. But then we all have to sacrifice to get to the prize. I mean, and so you do stuff that you don't want to do have a lot of the time. The other side of it is to be successful in this arena, probably any arena, is attention to detail and excellence. You do not put in these grants. If they can find something on page seven that you contradicted yourself on page three or 33, your grant's done. It's over. So you have to be, have to pay minute you know, detail, you know, attention to this minutia. And, and that's the downfall of a lot of, of uh, proposals. And I would say uh, my piece of advice would be to uh, don't be bashful about seeking external help. That was a joke. Thank you very much for our panel. <laughs>